Hi there, this is Sifu Slim, and I've had the good pleasure to have spoken the last few weeks with Jim Drever about wonderful things that relate to mind, body, and spirit. And today we um, decided, actually in our last video, we decided to talk about addiction. And previously we talked about his book, which is available by PDF, free to you if you go to Jim Drever, D-R-E-A-V-E-R.com. And you can send him an email through his website or through his email. And you will receive, if you'd like, a free PDF of his book, Untriggerable. So today on addiction, so we spoke about untriggerable. Then we spoke about boredom, which for a long time has plagued many people in our society. And then today, addiction. So I was looking through Jim's book, which I've had uh, the great pleasure to have been reading over the last few months. End your story, begin your life, wake up, let go, live free. So imagine me looking through this book, which I'm so glad that Jim gave me, um, and I'm looking for things on addiction. How hard do you think it was to find things on addiction in your book, Jim, for me? Uh -huh. Not Tell very me. hard at all. It was the first two pages I had turned to, I found things that related to addiction. So... I'll give your bio, Jim, a native of New Zealand, met European non-dual awakening master Gene Klein in 1984 and awakened to his true nature in 1995, 11-year process. Jim is the author of End Your Story, Begin Your Life, published by Hampton Roads, and has taught at Esalen Institute and elsewhere for many years. So welcome, Jim. Thank you, brother. Welcome. So I was thinking about our subject, and the first thing I thought about was human patterns. So people, if they're in a pattern, let's say it's a pattern that has one or several addictions, that's part of their current life. So maybe you can share, if you will, Jim, what it means to be in a pattern and what it means to either add new things to that pattern or remove things from that pattern that are unhelpful for you? Good. Well, let's begin by just breathing and relaxing into this moment now. Okay, let's do it. Just breathe and just notice how everything comes and goes in your awareness. Thoughts, feelings, beliefs, emotions, everything comes and goes, but you, the awareness of everything, don't come and go. You are, uh, here is the changeless awareness, witnessing, watching the ever-changing phenomena of your life. And the more you get in touch with the pure awareness you are, the more you realize, wow, I'm not my story. I have a story, but I'm not my story. I have an ego, but I'm not my ego. I have an I thought, but I'm not my I thought. I'm always this beautiful, changeless awareness that's right here, right now. And so my work really is really about the ego, getting seen with another ego, because there's the ego I get, that gets addicted, right? I've got to have this, I've got to get my fix. The I, I've got to get my fix, whether it's tea, coffee, drugs, sex, food, whatever we're addicted to. So the first thing is to begin to see that we're not this I that we thought we are, were, are, were. And um, then everything happens from there. So you have a specific question around addiction for me? Yes, I do. Okay, far away. Okay. So when we're involved in addiction, and as I mentioned, we have a pattern. So this is the addiction has become part of our new pattern. We wake up in the morning, our biochemistry is already craving something that may not be helpful to us. So what I've done for my life is I've worked on being balanced in mind, body and spirit. And since we are very sedentary, starting in the 20th century, and that's uncommon in the history of humans and animals. 
even an amoeba and a microorganism, there's a lot of little movement going on. They need energy and they're moving to acquire what they need and to multiply. So the human being has to do that movement. If we don't do that movement, our pattern is sedentary. And if we're sedentary, we may have bad posture. We lean forward on the computer, on the smartphone, what have you, and it brings us down. Then we may need a substance to either bring us down further and collapse us into that misery or to fake our system out and to light us up. So uppers light us up, downers bring us down. Psychedelics make us see things that are uh, different than what we ordinarily see. So those are some things that happen with substances. So maybe you could comment on waking up and how to get in the proper mindset. I do it through movement and nature and getting outside as quickly as I can. I'm not in a, in a mad dash, like I'm gonna reach for a drug or, or something bad if I stay in my home. But as part of my pattern, I get out as much as possible in the morning. And that's, to me, it's pretty much every day. Get grounded to the earth and I start to do that movement. So how would you advise someone who wakes up with the biochemical or the ego eye craving something? What, what should they do, Jim? Well, my teaching Sifu is I have people have people examine who they really are. They have an affirmation or a mantra that I teach, I'm not my ego. I'm not my ego. So you say that to yourself looking into the mirror, I'm not my ego. And get quiet and present with yourself. And all these judgments come up. But you realize that the very root of them, they're ego judgments about yourself and we're not our ego because our ego comes and goes we're not anything that comes and goes we are what is always here so you breathe into what is always here so in my teaching i teach people how to wake up and be with themselves for a few minutes just be with themselves in this watchful place aware place where they, they can see that they're not their ego and more and more they see that the truth of this, my God, I'm not my ego. I have an ego, but I'm not my ego. So I'm not my ego. And how, if someone is in a crisis situation, so let's say an addict could be in a crisis situation a large portion of their time and they wake up in that crisis mode, which is almost like a shaking scenario or a dread scenario at times for an addict. How do they move into that quiet space without your help? If they're doing it on their own, there's no internet, what have you. How can they do that? Do they need a book? Do they need a mantra by their side? Do they need to open their hearts up to love and wisdom? How would someone like that take that step to relieve that dread and relieve that biochemical urge to go do something unhealthful for themselves. Right. Well, on one level, of course, all those things are good. A mantra, a book, a uh, heart opening, a friend who really cares about them. But another level, they're in a crisis right now. And the crisis has to be dealt with. So we have all kinds of avenues in society for dealing with crisis. That's not my field. That's a different field, a different expertise. Yes, exactly. You, you, you got to deal with the critical situation yeah. first. Yep. So you were in the military and you, you know about crisis situations from there, but you were a young person. So you only knew, you know, what you knew between zero and 20, unless you were tapping into, you know, forces that were beyond your, um, your experiences and your learning. So, what would you do uh, now with more knowledge and more wisdom if you're in a foxhole in Vietnam and you're with someone who's about to reach for heroin and they're using that to mollify their current situation, which is dread of being killed, dread of being Vietnam and, and bitten by mosquitoes, maybe dread of their superior officer, uh, maybe even dread of going back home to a life they didn't like very much. What what would you do now with your advanced wisdom if you could plug that into Jim in his 20s 
and help that person with you in the foxhole in, in Vietnam? Well, that's quite a loaded, in some ways, question, Sifu. Um, but I just probably put on my hand and urge them not to take the heroin. We, we need all our resources for addressing the fight, the battle that we're in. That's what I do now. If I was there now, of course, I wouldn't, wouldn't be in Vietnam now. With all my wisdom now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you wouldn't be there. But let's say you were. So you would stop, physically stop the person from attaining that? Uh... Yeah, yeah. I'd say, hey, listen, brother, you, we, we need to take care of each other. We need to watch out for each other. I can't have you tripping out on heroin. Got it. So physically stop them. And then maybe you know work on whatever you had to do to to protect your position or move away from that position into a better position, whether it was offense or defense. Is that something that might might have crossed your mind? Yeah, yeah, of course. All right. Yeah. Uh, but the, any... but the, the the main thing is I wouldn't be in that situation now. I've, I've seen that, like General Sherman of the Civil War said, "War is hell." I think he said that. Maybe somebody else has said it. But many many people out. have said that. <laughs> and I've, I've been to one and I've witnessed it personally. And as it was the Vietnam War, when there was a young New Zealand officer, I was actually 20 years old, had my 21st birthday in Vietnam. And um, yeah, I wouldn't do it again. Got it. Okay. In fact, that's why I write books, you know, because to help alleviate the, the, the need for war. Yeah. I have a section in my book on politics and war, my new book, Untriggerable, which is available free right now. Tell us your email again. jdreaver at aol.com. One word. If you want the book, just send me an email with the word title and the subject line, free book. And I'll send you the book, Untriggerable. The letter J. D R E A V E R at AOL.com. Correct. And if people want coaching sessions with Jim, he's available through his website. Yes. And um, I'm also coach mind, body, and spirit. And I, I write books as well. And so I'm at Sifu, S I F U, slim.com. And, uh, and I'm learning a new thing thanks to Jim. And Jim, I'm sure you've had people like me who, done so much learning, so many courses, so many martial arts, so much introspection, so much work on self-mastery, that the idea of being awakened and having a new way of looking at things and a new way of living is there's resistance. So I was resistance, even though I liked you and I liked your philosophy, I was just thinking, my gosh, one more thing to master, <laughs> right? And you've heard, you've heard that before, I'm sure, from people. Yes, listen, it's, it's the easiest thing in the world to master because you, you don't have to change anything. I, lo I love the Zen saying, uh, after enlightenment, nothing changes, but yet, it, it, yet everything is somehow different. So nothing changes. Your circumstances are still the same. You'll still get to be you. You'll still do what you love to do physically, all the physical exercise and movement you love, Not skiing and everything like that. Nothing changes. You just, it's a difference in the way you see reality. Now you see with clear eyes. Yeah. You see with clear eyes. In fact, the subtitle of my book, Untriggerable, is how mastering conflict, mm -hmm. how mastering the conflicted ego, our conflicted ego heals our world. Got it. All right. And because, because it heals our personal world and then we can address the suffering around us. All right. All right. Um, hold, hold on one second. I've got some music coming in. Let me see if I can make a change on that. All right. So thank you for sharing that, Jim. And uh, another question I had uh, is why does it exist? And I know uh, people know that it's bad behavior to have these addictions. They might reach for the chocolate bar 
or the cigarette anyway. And one thing I talk about to people is with my exercise program, don't think of it as this big life-changing thing. Think of it as normal, like flossing your teeth before you go to sleep. Then I also tell people that if you tell your unconscious mind and your conscious mind that it's okay to miss flossing your teeth once, it's very easy to do that again. So bad behavior, you're telling your, your, uh, your mind that it's okay to have more of that, which would be like missing your flossing, missing your physical movement program. And that sets, sets in a new pattern. You have any thoughts, Jim, you wanna share on that pattern type of an idea? Yes, let me mull over this for a moment. We'll always come back to now as part of the process of awakening. Always come back when you're not sure about something, you just come back to the present moment. Really relax and be present without any story. I have a saying in the book, untriggerable, be present, heart open, no story. For people to be present without any story, they always have a, have a story, an agenda. But we're learning to have no agenda, to be free enough that we need no agenda. So what was your question? So breaking the pattern, uh, would you equate that to having a story and having a um, the, the agenda. So is that, are those things related? Your, your pattern, yes. your story, your new agenda? Yes, if they are. Okay. Because you, you, you've got to break the, the prime addiction here is not to a substance. The prime addiction is the ego eye that wants to escape itself. Got it. And so uh, this is how to treat addictions fun at the fundamental level root them out at the essence source, see that you're not this I. And it's all about seeing. It's only about seeing. It's mm -hmm. only ever about seeing that you're not this I. We have an I, but we're not the I. Why, why are we not the, the I? Because the I thought comes and goes. And we're not anything that comes and goes. We are what is always here. And what is always here, like we're, what is never not here, is that true nature, our essence, mm -hmm. which is pure, luminous presence, pure, luminous awareness or beingness. That's what's, that's what's always here. So we're just relaxing with the beingness we are. Now you have to be ready for this. You have to have a certain level of maturity. Got it. Uh, You're ready. Gonna... You're ready. Which is why we're doing this. Yes. So the, the, these are in a way our sessions. This is what I do in our private session. Work with people like this in this way. Yes. And see where you're, where, where you're so triggered. So um, part of my coaching is, are little steps that people can do to help change their mindset. And today I wore a yellow shirt. And this yellow color to me is very brightening. And I've got the light on me, did an exercise program this morning, foam rolling, did jujitsu with a friend. So I'm very mellow. I'm very satiated right now. And now I'm open for the sharing with Jim Drever. I'm open for the learning and I'm open to share thoughts with the audience. So that's how I did it today. I've got the yellow shirt on. I wanted to mention to people that there are dietary things like omega-3, part, part of our system is supposed to have omega-3 in balance with our omega-6. And we tend to eat a lot of meat and animal protein in the modern era. And uh, so one of the things we wanna do is bring that level of the omega-6s from meat up with the fish and the nut oil, uh, omega-3s. And so taking omega-3 and not having as much meat, there are many ways people can do it. Uh, one of the reasons people have cravings for sugar, for example, which can also fire us for other addictions, is not having enough fat and protein in our system, especially fat. So nuts, there's pistachios, and they're very flavorful, especially if you have the ones that have um, salt on them. And then raw almonds, a lot of fat 
and protein in there. So you can do really fun things with these foods. When you learn how to cook, you can soak the almonds, put them on your cereal, put them in uh, uh, cakes and things, put them in your pancakes, like shaved almonds. So many things you can do for your, your diet which is actually the, from the Greek word dieta, which means lifestyle. We all think that diet is just what we put on our body, but in ancient Greece, dieta meant your lifestyle. And then I'll throw in your lifestyle of wellness in there because if you have a diet, why would you wanna have a diet of doing harmful things? So maybe you can talk about some things that you do, Jim, that relate to the, not just the, the ego, but the practical steps that you do um, as someone who spent a lot of time in the in the field of wellness for helping you uh, with your biochemical needs to get the balance that you need to live another day of physicality, brain work, human interaction, coaching, et cetera. Well, Sifu, good question. So I, I'm just a normal person. I eat a healthy, conscious diet. I exercise. Right, right now, I'm recovering from an injury to my hip, as you know about that. And so I walk twice a day and do my physical exercises against a railing on a fence, uh, working my hip looser. The other day, I thought to myself, gosh, I'd like to get back to r running again. I haven't run actually since for 20 years almost. I say this since I had the strokes because I couldn't run. But now with this new hip, maybe I can, my gait will be such that I can run now. We'll see. Yeah, there, um, there are applications, you know, you know those things that people who have uh, a walking uh, problem, they can, they can use with the wheels on it. I imagine if there's a flat area there's a way to have some contraption to keep you from falling over where you could actually put a little weight and stability on something like that and then keep your feet more in the air, which is what running is, is one, your body's in the air and then landing on one foot, et cetera. So um, I'm sure there, there are applications and appliances out there that will allow people to do more of that with a more stable and safe way. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's funny the way we, the phases in life we go through. Like, I used to be a rugby player, right? As in my teens you, and 20s. You were, you were a professional, correct? Well, not a professional, but I was played at a high level. I love fact, it. In fact, I got, got these rugby scholarships to Palmer College of Chiropractic. I never took, up, never took it up because I actually went out the day and I got the letter from the coach. This is pre computers saying we, we needed you here, come to the States early because we've got a tournament in Canada. I, um, I went out and played a game of rugby but, and broke my leg. I got tackled and my leg was shattered to be a broken clean through and uh, we spent the next four months in the plaster cast. So strange twist turn of events. Uh, sometimes I think of what, what my life would have been like had I not broke my leg and taken up the rugby scholarships. Who knows? But yeah. Life is what it is. Yeah. These situations are presented to us and we have to deal with them. So, so you're saying it's okay to share your story. It's okay to know that this happened to you, but it's not a positive, productive thing to live with that um, hurting your normalcy, your balance in your life by constantly carrying that thing around as a big weight on yourself. Right. It's a, um, we have a story and I think I've shared with you, the more we know we're not our story, actually the better storyteller we become. Our stories are much more laser-like, much more focused, much yeah. more, cre more, more creative. Because of the mind, but when you realize you're not your story, particularly not this ego story. Your mind becomes 80% quieter. So you have more ease in you. You have more, you have, it's easy for you to relax. And you, you become quiet and present, totally aligned with this moment now. 
So if we have yes. more ease, we have less disease, correct? Exactly, that's how it works. Even physical problems adjust themselves when, you, when you're totally aligned spiritually with the, the, this moment now. And to be aligned spiritually means to be present in this moment now with no, just to relax into being, pure being. I often talk about being, doing, and having. Most people they don't, don't have a strong sense of being, so they're always doing something. something. They're always thinking about doing something, or actually doing something to help get the results they want to have so they can be happy. But with awakening, we've treated the other way around. We learn to establish ourselves in beingness here and now first. And then out of being, we do what we need to do. We have the results we have. But uh, uh, the results we have, we're not dependent on them for our well-being. It's already established in well-being. We're already established in the source of being within us. Deep, deep sense of oneness with this moment. Oneness with being here now. Breathing, relaxing, and being here now. It feels great. It certainly does. Um, the, um, the idea of doing all the time, it sounds to me like if someone's a doer and they're worried about productivity all the time, they might completely miss the balance portion of the human experience. And when you're out of balance and when you're always doing, you're not able to be in that, that calm, open, receptive, uh, understanding seeing position that I think you want to be as much as possible so you can experience this and you can be aware and you can be protective of others and yourself of taking a misstep. Does that sound like it's in line with your thinking? Totally in line with my thinking, yes. Well said, Steve. Listening to you say it, actually, I heard myself say it. <laughs> well, that's what mastery is when the... Uh, the teacher bestows the lesson, then the, the, the student has to master that lesson. So he becomes the message of the teacher and then he, he operates, he or she operates in their own way within that lesson. And then they can pass that on to a new entity who's gonna operate in their own way with that new lesson. Does that sound good? Sounds great. You know, I, I was saying about my, my book on Treatable, uh, the difference between a student and a master is that students still aspire someday to be a master. But the true master knows that he or she is always a student. That's right. That's right. And, um, you know, I, um, I've been at this, I call it, you know, human uh, self-mastery. Yes. Self-mastery self is not to dominate other people, not to dominate myself. It's to learn more about myself, where I fit in the universe, how I interact with other human beings and all of the things that are available in my, in my own world, in my universe. And that's a, that's a chore, um, but it's also a gift. It's a gift to, to go through the steps to master oneself and not easy to do it by age 15. I'm sure some people may have, um, but you know, why not work on that as part of uh, life's work? Yes, beautiful. Beautifully said. So uh, on the rational here and now side, um, I'm in drywall right now. We, my surroundings are drywall and wood framing and under that concrete. So um, I did read about the idea of nature, many much uh, in my research for my own book, Sedentary Nation, my first book on wellness, the aging athlete, my second, my third, raising a child athlete, question mark, things you need to know. One of the things I talk about a lot is this idea of nature. And if you get out into nature, it's very easy to remove yourself from your head, from the eye, you see the vastness of nature, you see the beauty, you see the challenges of nature, you see other moving things, the tree in the breeze, the squirrel going up the tree, the sun moving through the horizon, the clouds moving, the wind blowing the leaves. You see all these things 
And then just by default, if you're barefoot, you're grounded to the earth and that does something to your uh, chemically into your energy system. So wonderful things and getting out of the head, which I think is fine, you know, to write a book, you and I had to get inside of our heads, but we also had to let things come in from the outside and join with the thoughts that we already had to make, make a book that was entertaining, was helpful, was informative, and all the things we wanted to do with our books. So maybe you could speak about the idea of being out in nature and getting out of our heads a little bit, Jim. You know, I've always loved nature. And in fact, Shunra Suzuki, or T.T. Suzuki, a Zen master, said nature is the true teacher of Zen. Nature is the true teacher of Zen. And that's why sages and mystics have always had a great affiliation with nature, because there we observe our true nature. We get quiet and present. I love to hike and walk the hills, mountains, the ocean. I love all of that. Of course, limited right now to what I can do because of my handicap, my invalid status, but that's only temporary. And um, yeah, nature is a, it's all there. Nature shows us our true nature. So what I, I jotted down in preparing for our discussion today, Jim, is that if you're in drywall, rebellion is almost a guarantee that you're going to, in corporations and companies and at the school <clears throat> district or at the police office for the people receiving the calls, the dispatchers, et cetera, rebellion for them could be as simple as going to the break room at their office. And at the break room, it's not just about the food addiction, it's actually getting away, it's rebelling from being trapped in your cubicle, your chair, what have you, anything. If you do that for three hours or more, you, the, the, the only thing you can do to be out of that without leaving the building is to go to the break room or the bathroom. That's about it, or somebody else's cubicle. And if you're in the break room too much or you're at somebody else's cubicle, Someone may be watching you. Nowadays, they're watching you on camera and by your computer saying that this person's not currently active on their, on their task. So this rebellion idea happens when we're trapped inside drywall, when we're un, out of balance, when we're doing too much of one thing, uh, when we're bored, which we talked about in a previous con con conversation, and when we're being triggered. You know, We talked about that in our first year book, Untriggerable. So maybe talk about the idea of how to get freedom and not have to rebel when you're trapped. How can we get rebellion if we're in our cubicle? I'm sorry, how can we get freedom when we're in our cubicle? Actually, the perfect time to do that is in our cubicle or wherever we are. We, we close our eyes, breathe, and come back to this ego eye that we think we are. We've got to see that we're not our ego eye. That's, I promise you, when you see that, when you see it clearly, when you see it finally, my God, I'm not my ego. I have an ego, but I'm not my ego. It has to be seen as the fundamental shift in perception that is enlightenment or self-realization or self-mastery. Wonderful. Yeah, maybe we can take that up next time. Got it. Um, do, you, do you have another eight to 10 minutes to hit on a few more points or you think sure. that's you do, okay. All right. So I mentioned being trapped in drywall and I, I jotted down, we're not supposed to be trapped near our food, even if it's healthful food like this. We're not supposed to be trapped near our drink, even if it's healthful drinks like kombucha. And we're not supposed to be trapped by our medicine cabinet to go reach for our, uh, you know, our, our medicine all the time, you know, when there's a problem. And, the, the, you know, we mentioned boredom before, and then boredom leads to seeking a remedy. So the remedy could be food, drink, or something in the medicine cabinet. I mentioned the break room at work, the fridge, the TV, the medicine cabinet at your home. These are all things that are common for people to reach for the TV, the remote, the computer, the smartphone, you know, people are reaching for something because of 
these things, addiction, boredom, rebellion. Um, what are your thoughts on how to handle these? You, you wrote untriggerable. So touch on again, even though we mentioned this, the smartphone before, what is an actual step that you might help use to coach somebody when they're constantly looking down at this smartphone to see if there's a new bit of contact that someone's reaching out for uh, through the, the smartphone to connect with the individual. Right. That's our trigger, right? Let's take that trigger, the smartphone. I'm going to check this call because I need attention. I need to be reminded that, that I exist. So that's our trigger. So we're going to see our trigger. So how do I work with people in my sessions and in this interview with you and in general in my presentations to larger groups? Because I've had people look at their triggers and they're going to see that there was their ego that was triggered, the eye that was triggered. That's what the trigger is, the ego eye. I'm, I must have this. I must have that. I'm going to need this. I need that. Who is the side that needs it? You really see that that was then and this is now. And so you breathe, you relax, and you revisit the triggering incident. And you realize, yes, that was then, this is now. I'm not being triggered right now. And so you breathe and relax into the feeling of ease and harmony and flow right here, right now. And you realize, my God, I see how my ego does get triggered, but I'm not my ego. You firm again, I'm not my ego. You look in the mirror and you see what the, the self-judgment comes up, self-loathing comes up. You are welcome all of that because it's showing you where you're not yet free. And eventually you, it takes many, many times to see this, but uh, eventually you see your mind becomes quiet, the ego becomes less active. You begin to live from a deeper place inside you place of true wisdom, of true compassion, of true authenticity. What does it mean for you to be authentic? It means to be yourself or myself in my case, to be totally myself, authentic. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, uh, just to be myself without any story, without any errors, without any false bravado, just to be oneself, myself. I guess if um, we are our own true selves and we're at peace with that, we're very approachable to, by others who may have a positive interaction with us, who may assist us with what we may need, allows us to assist them with what they may need, sharing the human experience, all these wonderful things, rather than being in that ego, with the fight, flight, freeze, with the I need right now something from this person. So I'm going to maybe be a little too aggressive, maybe to be too forward. We're not going to be like the two lion clubs, cubs, lion cubs who are playing and learning how to interact through the rolling around like we do with jujitsu. And we can experience that connection with, uh, with the other lion cub. Um, maybe share a little bit about human connection while we are our own true selves and authentic. It's, it's, it's all about connection, right? Everything is about the way we connect. And we connect with the people who are like in jiu-jitsu because you have a common interest. But um, it's the interest that brings us together. But when we can no longer fulfill that interest or no longer turns us on, we look for something else. When we're just being ourselves, truthfully, when we master the ego, that's the, the whole thing. You've got to master this ego. And master the ego simply means, my God, seeing that you're, you're not your ego. You have an ego, but you're not your ego. The more you see that, the more you've mastered that. True, that's self-mastery, to see that you're not your ego. That's true self-mastery. Oh. And then you flow with everything everything and everyone, and everyone you meet is a delight. Everyone you meet is a mirror of you, you, you and your essence. You, you mentioned uh, 
the being in the flow and the flow state is something that's very common in sports um, performance and sports psychology. So these elite athletes and even the, the 12 year olds, they're te trying to teach these people how to be in the flow state. So I was thinking about road rage, which is, uh, you know, of course, out of the flow state, but one could be in a flow state and have someone come by and cut them off or do something that uh, is not safe in a driving situation, or they could just wind up being in a, from a flowing traffic where they're going the speed limit to a stop, a complete stop, and right. then like instant tension. So then we've got the fight, flight, and freeze mechanism, and we can easily go into a, a self-loathing, a situation-loathing, a, a reaction, uh, with uh, violence, with anxiety, all these types of things. And we can be, re be removed from the flow state almost instantly if we're not thinking uh, the proper way or feeling that flow where, oh, okay, now I'm in this jam up and I'm go I've got to go back to my normal flow and being present and being awake and all those things that you've talked about. So is it possible for you to share a routine that allows us to go from the flow zone, see an impediment, a block, uh, an interaction that's negative, and still allow us to assess it in an open-minded way and remain as much in the flow as we can, Jim? Good question, Sifu. Yeah, I'm in, I'm, I drive, and uh, I drive in my normal state, which is awake, present, no story. So I'm not thinking about any story. I'm just totally being aware of my driving. And that's how I live most of the time. Whatever I'm doing or I'm not, not doing anything, I'm just aware and present here and now with no story. So you've got to see that this, the more you, the free you are, the more you live in a state of awareness, consciousness, the unchanging awareness you are. And then, we're still human, we still have an ego, so reactions can happen, we can, residues can arise, and um, we may get cut up by a driver and we think, fuck, or something like that, but we quickly, it's only a brief interruption, we quickly come back to adjust to a new situation and come back to this moment now. That's how we drive with freedom and grace. Love those words, freedom and grace. Yes, um, beautiful words, huh? Beautiful, um, you know, grace. It's, it's, you know, common in the Martin Luther King speeches, the, the word of grace in the song, and there's amazing grace. So it's almost amazing when you become in the flow and non-reactive. Imagine the grace, uh, how beautiful it is that you can handle anything. So if you go back to, the man who wrote the song, Amazing Grace, he was a slave trader and he took an old uh, melody and he wrote new words to it. Right. And uh, he, he, he changed his mind about the slave trade after having made money in it and uh, went back and wrote the song. So it is, it's just an amazing transformation that happened in his life. Why can't we do it with a little bit of road rage? You know, why can't we have an amazing thing happen, which is, a smile, which is, oh my, look at this, and just kind of smile at it and get back into our zone and be present with the, or the, our true authentic self. Beautiful, beautiful, Sifu. We, we can. We can. Boy, a little light can happen. Yes. I am um, the place where I exercise down by the beach quite frequently. There are there are um, carpenter ants on the tree, and that's the limb I use to do a lot of hanging exercises like stretches, knee ups, and chin ups. And I look at these ants, and I don't believe an ant sleeps. I think it's a 24 hour a day type of work, and they are just going about their business, doing what they have to do. And they do a lot of communication. They bump into another ant, and, and then they go around that other ant, and maybe there's a communication of what's needed or where the root is. There's something going on, perhaps. I'm sure an ant behaviorologist would know that. So I'm watching these things. I'm going, look at the, 
resilience that these things have. Look at the discipline these ants have to just keep about their task and live in the present and get what they need to have accomplished, accomplished. And, you know, if I reach up and one is crushed by my, by my hands, which is possible, I'm sure I've crushed many ants in my life. The other ones assess that. And uh, I, there's some ants that would attack me, you know, those African ants and what have you. But these ants just go about their business and uh, keep on moving, keep on trucking, as they used to say in the, in the 1960s and 70s. The, um, the rule of when there is something that sets you off and it triggers you, I've heard of people talk about a three second rule. I've heard of people talk about a 15 second rule or a one minute rule and breathing and peace and calm. Um, is that something that we should take one step further and bring in the proper way to handle that, that moment of reaction and relaxation and awareness uh, through what you teach? Yes, yes, it's a, um, what I teach, of course, is we're not our ego. The ego is, that has to be seen. Most people don't see that. Most people think they are their ego, which is why it's always conflicted. The more you see that you're not your ego, the more at ease you feel. The more you see that you're not your ego, the more relaxation you feel, the more present you are, the freer you are. It's a wonderful thing to be free, to be free of anything, everything, to be free inside your head. You realize nothing inside your head is ultimately real because it comes and goes, shifts and changes. But you are always here. You are the beautiful, pure, luminous presence that is always here. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Slim, I have to go now. All right. So Jim's book again, End Your Story, Begin Your Life. Another book, Untriggerable. And jimdriever.com. And then jay at aol.com. Jay Driever, sorry. Jay Driever at aol.com. If you'd like to receive a free copy via PDF of Untriggerable. And we will be back with more in the future. I'm Sifu, S-I-F-U Slim at sifuslim.com. And we're wishing you all the best in your health, happiness, and wellness, and your journey of being awakened in your current life. Aloha. Beautiful. Aloha, brother.